Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. What's the latest on implementing Seattle's goal to have zero traffic deaths or injuries by the year 2030? What challenges are involved as the city expands its preschool program and begins work on social housing? Plus, what's community wealth building and how could it impact you? Councilmember Tammy Morales joins me to answer these questions and some of the ones you're sending in too, next on Council Edition. The point of social housing is to ensure permanent affordability of rent. That's what it's for. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. And I'm here with Councilmember Tammy Morales from District 2. Thank you very much for being here. I wanted to jump right in with the work you're doing with Vision Zero, the city's plan to have zero traffic deaths or injuries by the year 2030. The council recently heard a top to bottom review of this program from SDOT, the Seattle Department of Transportation. And I read it in your press release right afterwards. You were glad to see SDOT provide this study, but you also had some big concerns too, especially because so many deaths and injuries are happening in your district, District 2. Let me know about those concerns and just some opening thoughts on Vision Zero. Sure. Well, I thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, I do want to acknowledge first that SDOT can get it right. Uh, very often they do. Um, you know, when it comes to safety, for example, uh, they made some quick changes to Fourth Avenue to deal with uh, the many challenges that are happening there. They, um, you know, installed a temporary bike lane when the um, uh, uh, Spokane Bridge shut down. Yes. So these are examples of um, the sort of quick action that we need to see safety improve across the city. Um, I am concerned. You know, I have the highest fatality rate for traffic-related uh, deaths um, mm -hmm. in District 2. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I will say that my kind of big takeaway from the Vision Zero report was that there's a lot of work for the department to do internally. I, uh, I appreciate the new director's focus on safety. I do think that that is a priority for him. And my understanding, my takeaway from the report is that they're really shifting internal workings, in, uh, incorporating safety as a priority through every uh, division within the department, mm -hmm. which is great. Yeah. Um, it can't happen too soon. Yeah, yeah. Now we got to see some action, right? I've received a ton of feedback from Seattle Channel viewer, Seattle Channel viewers about Vision Zero, and I wanted to share two pieces with you, if I could. Josh wrote this: Ideally, SDOT would proactively be fixing traffic designs that can be dangerous. Short of that, can there be a simple way for regular, everyday street users to connect with the right personnel and get action on those poor designs? Got that one. Then here's one from Eric, who wrote to me about the idea of banning right turns on red lights in some intersections throughout the city, which you've been supportive of as a safety measure. He says this, while I support no right on red, there are several intersections I know of in the city that must be changed before this policy is adopted. Without changes, traffic will grind to a halt and people will break the law. Is there a place for the public and SDOT to register signals that must change before no right on red becomes law? Thanks to both of you for those emails there, Eric and Josh. And I'm really seeing two issues here, Councilmember Morales. One, where and how can the public give feedback on where intersections need fixing in Seattle? And two, maybe if you could touch on this no right on red idea. Sure. Well, you can contact the department. I mean, each uh, part of town has a liaison from SDOT, uh, and I can get that information sure. back for you to post. You bet. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of the no right on red, I do think that that's important. Um, one of the things it's important to understand are the, the kind of principles around Vision Zero, mm -hmm. right? So the, the three key principles are that um, traffic fatalities, traffic injuries are preventable, that humans make mistakes, uh, and that this isn't the success of the Vision Zero goals. These efforts aren't going to be tied to individual behavior, right? This is about designing a system that makes it easy for people to do the right thing. And so, for example, uh, you know, road diets, no ride on red, um, keeping uh, uh, streets, you know, crosswalks, signal timing, the kind of things that can help slow people down are going to be important. And the no ride on red is an example of, you know, enforcing, hopefully, enforcing the law, uh, enforcing the road design, um, the road signals so that people stop and look and pay attention to who's in the crosswalk, who's coming through the intersection, and just giving people, you know, a moment 
to be observant about their surroundings so that people don't get injured anymore. Right. And we've seen these situations where the pedestrian go sign, go heads out, it, it goes into action before the green light actually goes. Right. These are the types of right. measures we're talking about here. But I wanted to ask a question beyond this one, which is, what will it cost to implement some of these ideas and how will the city pay for that, which is always part of the discussion here. SDOT Director Greg Spott said he had a $5 million gap in federal funding he's facing. You said you'd partner with him to work on that. Reconstructing roads is expensive. And I just Absolutely. wanted to talk about this and how the city would pay for that. That's a great question. Um, this does require a lot of funding. Uh, most of it is federal funding. Um, you know, transportation infrastructure funding coming from the feds is how we is how we pay for this. Um, most of the city budget for transportation comes from the federal government, um, and the, a, a lot of it is grant funded. So. Um, I'm working with Councilmember Peterson, who's the chair of transportation, uh, to try to fill that gap so that we can fund the, um, I think there was something like 130 projects in that last right. uh, $27 million grant that we received. Mm -hmm. uh, the gap means that there are some projects that are currently not funded. So we are trying to figure out how we close that. Um, you know, Councilmember Peterson is also interested in uh, observing or uh, exploring a um, the impact, impact fees. fees. Yeah, I was going to ask you to, about that. To try to create a revenue source for some of these projects. And, and um, just real briefly on that, folks, this is a situation where developers would pay into a fund when they're working on big projects such that the city could pay for infrastructure like transportation. Go on. What, yeah, what's the deal and with so this? The, so there is already a project list of priorities uh, that, this, that the department has should funding become available. Um, and these are safety improvements, signal improvements, curbs, sidewalks. Um, and so the, you know, if the funding from a transportation impact fee or the additional funding that we're looking for to fill that gap, uh, those are the kinds of priority projects that would be um, that would be completed if that funding becomes available. Got it. Thank you for that. You mentioned enforcement earlier, and I saw an interesting counterpoint to this issue in the Seattle Times a few weeks ago from Danny Westneat. He expressed some concern that the city is moving away from using police enforcement to change driver behavior to changing the structure of our roads. He wrote this. Here's an excerpt. We're in denial if we think we're going to get to zero, referring to zero deaths and injuries, without the cops involved. In 2018, the year I got my cell phone ticket, there were more than 3,000 drivers tagged for driving while talking or texting. Last year, that was down by about 80 percent, so a lot fewer tickets being written here. Does anyone believe texting behind the wheel has been nearly eliminated? Me neither. They just aren't enforcing it anymore. I just wanted to talk about that overarching issue of police enforcement. What role should it play when it comes to achieving Vision Zero? So I think, you know, we can't conflate things like minor traffic stops, which very often uh, we've seen across the country can lead to escalation into injury or death for some people. Yeah. Uh, I think when we're talking about enforcement, it's, it, the question is, what are we enforcing, right? So those kinds of broken tail light, yeah. you know, those sorts of and things. And are we doing it equitably? That's a right. huge part of it. And that, this is the essential question, yeah. right? So, um, and so when you hear people say they don't want police involved in, in traffic enforcement, it's because of incidents like that. Mm -hmm. That is not to say that reckless driving, driving under the influence, um, things that can really uh, result in harm or, or traffic fatality shouldn't be enforced. They absolutely should. Uh, from my perspective, adding things like traffic camera enforcement is something that um, can help mitigate some of the interaction that could lead to escalation um, and is also something that we uh, can use to um, make sure that people are paying attention. You yeah. know, we know that if people are issued a, a warning with a traffic light, uh, very often they don't get a second warning. And so it is one way to move us toward having people become more aware of their surroundings, understand that there will be enforcement, even if it's just a traffic camera, right. uh, and can really start to uh, reduce the number of incidents and the number of um, traffic violence, the and, amount of traffic violence we have. Thank you. And I wanted to talk about just one uh, final issue here with Vision Zero with regard to where this work needs to happen. It's not just a downtown issue. And I think a lot of people might yeah. think that. Can you talk about that? Because D2's definitely got some issues. There's sure. issues all over the city. There are. You know, uh, Rainier Avenue, MLK, yeah. we, I personally see lots of speeding, lots yeah. of people running red lights. Um, but we know that the same is true on Aurora. It's yeah. true on 15th Avenue. So, um, you know, and, and and the reason it happens on those roads is because of the way that they are designed. Mm. And so I think when it comes to Vision Zero and the work that the department has to do, 
yes, they need their entire department internally to be focused on safety. And very quickly, we need to shift to changing the, the way we design our roads and to changing the existing road design so that we can start to see traffic calming measures yeah. across the city. Yeah, thank you for that. One last transportation message I received from a viewer about sound transit and the choice it's making now on how to have light rail go through the Chinatown ID neighborhood in your district. The writer says this, CID 4th Station, he's referring to 4th Avenue here, would create a superior transit hub for CID, Rainier Valley, and D2 residents, making it easy for our community and workers, many who are transit dependent, to most effectively connect with the existing preeminent regional transportation network. Thank you for sending that message in here. There's a lot of disagreement, I know, about this 4th Avenue option. It would be a great transit connection, but it would be really disruptive to the neighborhood to build it. So it looks like Sound Transit is pursuing another option at the point, uh, at this point to build stations on the north and south ends of the CID to avoid that disruption. Critics would say it's not as efficient from a transportation perspective. It, it sounds like you've been supportive of that north and south option. I just want to talk about that real quick. Sure. Well, you're right. The the 4th Avenue option um, is going to be very disruptive. Um, so the, the proposal is to build two stations on either side of the district, of the Chinatown International District. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the decision that Sound Transit made was to study both. Right. Uh, the North and South is being uh, advocated as the preferred alternative, but that doesn't mean that the Fourth Avenue shallow will not also be studied. Mm -hmm. And we'll see, you know, there this is not a final decision for either situation, yeah. um, it really is going to take a deeper assessment and analysis of, you know, the geographic issues, the, the um, geologic issues. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Fourth Avenue is on, in a um, on fill. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, you know, there are a lot of decisions to be made still, and yeah. it will depend on what these assessments say. Uh, race and social justice issues too. Can, can you talk to me about this? And just this whole balance between making sure you don't disrupt a neighborhood too much. And CID has been through a lot when you talk about transportation infrastructure that's run through there. Then you balance it with the need to have a, a great system that everybody wants to use. Uh, help me out with that. Absolutely. You know, I, I, we all know the challenges that the neighborhood has had between the stadiums and the I-5 and, you know, all of the things that have completely disrupted the neighborhood. And so it is, um, it is problematic to expect that that district is going to happily bear the burden of yet another government infrastructure project. Um, and it shouldn't be the case that we expect this neighborhood to just you know, accept being sort of collateral damage um, in this project. So. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody is saying that we don't need a very vibrant transit system, of um, and we want to make sure that what, whatever we do, it allows for people to move through the region um, safely and quickly and efficiently. And we can't keep asking communities of color to uh, bear the burden of creating these systems and not have something to say about it. Thank you very much for that. I wanted to move on to another topic here with generational wealth. You just held a forum on this issue in the Neighborhoods, Education, Civil Rights, and Culture Committee that you lead. Can we start with a definition for people as to what this term means and, and what you're trying to do with this effort? Sure. Um, yeah, so in my committee, we had uh, folks from Richmond, Virginia, and from Chicago come and talk to us about the work that they're doing. Um, what this is really about is, is uh, community wealth building. So rather than focus on um, on an individual's wealth or a household's wealth, this is about shared ownership, so shared uh, control of an asset. Uh, and what, what some cities are doing and what Seattle is actually researching right now is how do we move, uh, how do we create the opportunity, for example, for an entire neighborhood to buy shares in a block of buildings? Mm. Uh, it's very similar to what some of the work that Africa Town is doing right. right now, right? Where we have um, limited equity housing uh, co-ops, we have worker-owned co-ops, we have the ability for neighbors to buy back lots that you know their neighborhood may have lost, mm -hmm. uh, so that we can bring people back to the neighborhood. And it's really an effective community economic development strategy for addressing uh, the displacement that that many communities have seen. Um, so we had folks come in from Chicago and Richmond. They talked about the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it really is an exciting opportunity to uh, to create a more democratically owned uh, ownership model yeah. for 
for neighbors across the city. And I wanted to dive into uh, specifically from Richmond. You heard from the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Human Services, Reginald Gordon mm -hmm. uh, is his name, who said his city's program has helped a lot of people gain employment and control their economic future, but it's not as many uh, people as the city had first hoped. I wanted to play a clip of what he said. You know, so we can serve hundreds of people that way. Our original goal was to get thousands of people out of poverty each year. We pivoted because we knew that was not that was not going to serve any of us well to keep using that language because of systemic issues. And there are people who were, everyone had a different starting point. I wanted to bring this up just to consider the challenges of building generational wealth. When you hear about the people you're trying to serve having different starting points, as Mr. Gordon sure. pointed out there, some of them need a whole host of wraparound services too. So I'm trying to figure out who you're reaching out to in your vision of gener generational wealth. Is it people who are already employed or where do you even start with this? Well, again, I think there's there was a really uh, there are really different approaches that Richmond and Chicago are taking, yeah. and that's kind of the point that we were trying to make, right? So, so the Richmond approach was really about individual households, right. moving people into job training, giving them educational opportunities, um, and that is in some ways a much bigger task because you're talking about, you know, thousands of households that mm -hmm. you're trying to serve. In a very intensive effort, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, the work that Chicago is doing is a little bit different because this is about systems and it's about creating, for example, financial mechanisms, financial tools that allow community members to invest in a property. It's about providing uh, the opportunity for a community to buy something. And so they are, it's the difference between, you know, individual and shared neighborhood wealth. Um, what we're doing here in the city of Seattle, our Department of Neighborhoods has been uh, studying, researching these different models for the last year or so. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do have a, a, a generational wealth initiative. The, the department is piloting several of these um, ideas to see what might work here in Seattle. Okay. Uh, you know, can we start another community land trust? Can we start a community investment vehicle that allows people to buy shares in a property? Um, can we support small businesses with, for example, a worker-owned co-op model? Yeah. Okay. So this is a little bit uh, sort of higher level of um, of intervention rather than individual households, and I think there's an opportunity to scale it a little bit better. Uh, thank you, and and. Is there any legislation that you're working on? I, I thought I read that you were trying to incentivize some developers to get involved here. What, what's cooking? Well, so there's, as I said, several things. We've got projects that are being piloted right now. Um, my office, for example, uh, invested a little bit of money in doing a feasibility study for a community investment tool, okay. right? So how, can we create um, some sort of crowdsourcing um, vehicle for people to buy shares? Yeah. That work is still underway. It's one of the things that the Department of Neighborhoods is looking at. Okay. Um, but it really is about providing these opportunities. And, and you know, the challenge that we have in Washington is that our Constitution prohibits the gift of public funds you to business. You can't just give them away. That's right. Which and, in Chicago, you can. That's a yeah, big difference. Yeah, so if you watched that committee, yeah. uh, the woman from Chicago was like, oh. <laughs> we don't have that problem, that's right? That's not a problem for us. <laughs> right, so, right. so we do have some things that we're going to have to work around. Um, and, you know, where I might be going with this is to really just try to create an office of community wealth building in the city to start bringing people together in a really systematic way to start trying to crack that nut. Fascinating process. And I wanted to take a, a brief segue, if I could, because the whole concept of wealth and income inequality was a big part of the debate over Initiative 135, which voters approved mm -hmm. back in February to establish a public development authority to create social housing, so public affordable housing. You recently put out a video on Seattle City Council's YouTube channel to help explain the city's role in building out this program. And there are two big priorities that I'm seeing here. The first is getting people to serve on the PDA board. Those applications are due March 31st. If you're interested, it's crunch time here, folks. The second is the city's requirement to pay for the startup of the PDA for at least the first 18 months. Can you give us an overview of what's happening with social housing right now? How's the council involved? Sure. So uh, as you said, the first job is to seat this board. Uh, the board is comprised, will be comprised of 13 members, and the city council is responsible for appointing only two of those. So we've been convening all of the appointing entities. Mm -hmm just to make sure everybody understands what this process is. Yeah. Uh, so for example, the Seattle Renters Commission is appointing seven. Mm -hmm. um, the Green New Deal Oversight Board is appointing one. Mm -hmm. The mayor gets one appointment. That's right. Um, 
And then we want to make sure that there are folks on who already understand what affordable housing financing mm -hmm. looks like, yeah. what affordable housing production looks like. Yeah. So for this initial board, El Centro de la Raza gets to appoint uh, an affordable housing developer seat. I see. Um, and then the council is appointing somebody who's an urban planner and somebody who is familiar with nonprofit finance. Yeah. Um, and development. Okay. So that's a lot of different yeah, moving parts hands there. And yeah, hands yeah, in you the bet. Mm -hmm. um, but we are all on the same page about you know we need to appoint uh, this board needs to be seated by April thirtieth. That's right. Uh, and they need to have their first meeting by May thirtieth. Mm -hmm. So that's where that's, we are right now. That's light speed for city government. Getting so, all yeah, of that done for sure. Uh, and then your second question is about uh, the funding. Yeah. So th when the initiative passed, um, there's language in the initiative that said that the city would provide funding for the first 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, we and it can be in kind, but but the language said would also pay for the first two staff people. Yeah. Um, what we are learning is that uh, the city charter. Uh, requires that we wait until the next budget cycle to change a budget that has already been adopted. Okay, okay. Which we did last year. Sure. Um, so for now, what we will be doing is trying to get some money in our supplemental budget to, to help, you know, get things started. We can provide in-kind office space. Right. Uh, and supplies, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then we will probably have to wait uh, until the 2024 budget to actually be able to provide the funding for the staff positions. Okay. That said, um, we've also been working with the state legislature right. to try to get some funding from the state operating budget uh, to help provide that yeah. support. Frank Chop's been working on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've been working with Frank Chop, um, and it's got a lot of support from the Seattle delegation. So we'll see. Those conversations are happening. I think the decisions will get made this week, okay. and uh, I'm hoping for good news. <laughs> and, and we will follow up on that one. I just wanted to really talk about this with you, Councilmember Morales, because you've been a champion of social housing on the council. You talked about these issues during a public online forum earlier this month, moderated by Real Change, the news outlet which helped provide a voice for low-income and homeless people. I just wanted to ask that big overarching question of where do you see social housing going in the long term? How is it going to help Seattle? The point of social housing is to ensure permanent affordability of rent. That's what it's for. Um, and the way we do that, the way it's done in other cities and countries, is that the land itself is publicly owned land, right? So that takes a huge cost out of the production uh, and it allows for um, cross subsidization right. for the rest, right? The so higher renter people helping yeah, the lower. Yeah. And so that, in that way, it is very different from the traditional way that we do affordable housing because right. this isn't intended just for low income people. Mm -hmm. People from across an income spectrum can rent. Um, the other benefit of it is that you know, in traditional affordable housing, if you uh, qualify for that, but then you get a promotion or you get a better job and your income goes up, you're kicked out. With social housing, that doesn't happen. And because it, it can, you know, uh, it is for people across income spectrum. And so it ensures affordability. It ensures stability for families uh, so they don't have to worry about getting pushed out and, and moved around. Um, and it really is another way we were talking about, you know, household wealth or individual yeah, right. wealth. It really is a way for people to have the kind of stability that they need to be able to focus their energy on other ways they can build their own assets and right. build stability for their families. So okay. um, really looking forward to this. We're, we're at the very beginning stages yeah. of it. It's going to take some time to actually get it get to the production phase. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm very hopeful that this is going to be a, kind of a game changer for the city. Very interesting to watch this play out. Thank you for that. I wanted to talk about your recent meeting with Mayor Harrell and Dwayne Chappelle, director of the Department of Education and Early Learning at La Escuelita Bilingual School in Columbia City to talk about the expansion of the Seattle Preschool Program, yeah. which is funded by the city's Families Education Preschool and Promise Levy. So this is one of seven new sites, as I understand it, SPP sites in Seattle for the upcoming school year. Can you talk to us about the growth of this program and what it means? Sure. Well, as you mentioned, the Seattle Preschool Program is funded by the by the FEP levy. Yep. Um, and part of the investment strategy of that levy uh, was to spend just over $300,000 over the seven years of the levy. So for this particular program, it started at, I think, $38 million in 20, for the 2019-2020 school year. Okay. And then every year after that, we add another two, three, four million dollars. Mm -hmm. So for the 23-24 school year, we're now at 48 million dollars. 
And what that means is that we've been able to, or we will be able to expand the number of classrooms, particularly the number of dual language classrooms, big, which I'm very yeah. excited about. You, you, had a, you had a daughter that went to a lot of My daughter went yeah. there, yeah, as very a preschooler. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she still speaks Spanish. Bueno, uh, all right. A <laughs> little bit. <laughs> yeah. um, and so it really is an important way for us to make sure that Seattle's children have access to high quality early learning. Um, and in the case of some of these classrooms, at least, that if they speak another language, um, or if their parents want them to learn another sure. language, they have the opportunity to do that too. Okay, and, and this really feels like a part of your background. I remember the trip you took a couple years ago now to Nantes, uh, mm -hmm. France, mm -hmm. and just talking about the 15-minute the city, meaning you're this close to daycare, you're this yeah. co close to transit. This sort of plays into that theory, it feels yeah, like. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know it is really important for families uh, to be able to access their essential goods and services without having to get into a car it, you know, that's the goal of a 15 minute city for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which is it is just makes for a more neighborly community. If you can, you know, walk to preschool, walk to the grocery store, get to know your neighbors, sure. run into folks, um, you know, it just makes for a, a more vibrant community and, and a little bit more community cohesion, which oh. I think... We right could now, use, we yeah. all need. <laughs> yeah, and always good to learn from a sister city here. Uh, one quick piece here, just a challenge here. We've seen a lot of headlines recently about layoffs for central staff for Seattle Public Schools or talk of consolidating some schools. Yeah. And I know that's, that's a separate budget, folks. That is the school district's job. It is not the Seattle City Council's job there. But do those concerns about the near-term future of lower enrollment for Seattle Public Schools, does that have an impact on what you're doing with SPP? Well, to the extent that we really need to make sure our teachers are well Funded. Yeah, right. You know, I mean, so, you know, um, across the the economy, we're dealing with uh, retention issues. Yep, worker right? shortages, There's you bet. Worker shortages mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, that is particularly true for uh, um, industries that have traditionally been thought of as women's work. Right. Right. So things that are in the care industry and mm -hmm. teachers certainly fall into that. Yeah. So I do think it's important if we want to make sure that our that our students, that our young people have access to high quality educators, mm -hmm. that we are paying them well, that they get good benefits. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, with the Seattle Preschool Program in particular, we're offering uh, quality coaching and training That's so right. that they uh, get the support that they need, not just the lead teachers, but the assistant teachers mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So there's certainly a lot of work to do. Retention is an issue across the education field. Right. Um, and, you know, and teachers are certainly no exception. Absolutely. One piece to wrap up here. We have just about a minute. And I wanted to talk about a presentation you're working on with your Seattle and Reach Town Hall program there yep. with regard to arts and the comprehensive plan. I know I'm only giving you a minute here, but this sounds like a fascinating topic. The, the point of this is to talk about the comprehensive plan so people understand why it's important. This particular conversation is about the intersection of the arts community, the creative sector, and land use. Uh, so we're going to have a great panel of speakers to talk about, um, you know, how to make sure that we have affordable housing for artists, mm -hmm. that we have affordable commercial uh, cultural space for production and performance and rehearsal, uh, and really how we make sure that our artists are able to stay in the city. So I'm really looking forward to it. I am too. Well, that's Council Member Tammy Morales. I'm Brian Callanan. Thanks for joining us on Council Edition. We'll see you next time.